Hello, 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 dear design leaders from around the world. I'm Ekaterina from Future London Academy and welcome back to our leadership series. And today my guest is fantastic, wonderful Sinead Keenan, business psychologist with over 12 years of experience. And uh, she knows everything about the topic of leadership, change management, how to give feedback, how to motivate people. So I'm so excited about our conversation today. And I have lots of questions about how can we be better leaders? How can we uh, work with our teams and uh, give people feedback and manage uh, our creative uh, designers and people that we work with? Well, so good to see you and welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, today will be a very productive conversation about all things psychology. But before we dive into that, I have 10 rapid fire questions for you. Are you ready to answer them? Oh gosh, as ready as I'll ever be. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> okay, say first thing that comes into mind. Some of them are, I have to say, very hard to think on the spot, so don't stress if you can't find the perfect answer, just say first thing that comes to mind. Okay, coffee or tea? Oh, coffee. I'm probably the only Irish person you'll ever meet who does not drink tea. Ah. So yes, coffee every day. Your favorite book on psychology or leadership? Um, favorite book. One that has stuck with me, um, which I think a lot of people would enjoy reading, is The Power of Habit by Charles Dewey. Um, you might have heard of it. It's a great book. Highly recommend it. Love it. Read it. Recommend it. Oh, good. <laughs> Describe yourself in three words. Uh, calm, I think. Generally calm. Optimistic. Um, curious. I would use exactly those three words to describe <laughs> you. This is great self-awareness. Love it. <laughs> Working from home or office fun? Um, I think, oh God, probably a hybrid at the moment. Um, yeah, like many people, I think a hybrid is probably the best. Makes sense. What is one thing that annoys you the most? <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, a pet peeve is probably spoken like a true Londoner who's been here too long. People standing on the left-hand side of the escalators in the tube. <laughs> I mean, it is annoying, I have to say. I know, it's not, it's, it's not you know, it's not the worst thing in the world, but yeah, Whoa. pet peeve. Uh, well, talking about London, your favorite sport place, space in London? Sports place, did you say? Oh, sport or oh, place okay. or anywhere, anywhere sport, you love. Sport place is <laughs> not me, but um, favorite space in London. I probably say along the South Bank. I think I just love going for walks there. And nice, it's very, very artistic there as well. So and very creative vibe. Um, place on the planet every person should visit. The north of Norway. I think um, my husband is from Norway, and uh, I would highly recommend people definitely put it on the bucket list that is a, a great place i've been somewhere in norway i'm not sure where i was <laughs> but it was, <laughs> it was in the middle of nowhere uh, but it was amazing professional achievements you are the most proud of i think probably leading the team at mind gym the solutions team our team of psychologists and behavioral scientists amazing and last question what is the best part about working in business psychology I think it's, for me, it's about taking interesting but valuable insights from psychology, which sometimes feel like they could just sit in books and gather dust on shelves, but actually, what can we distill that will be useful for people? Amazing. Thank you so much, Sinead. You, you are done now with... I passed the test. Yeah, you passed the test. We can continue. Good. Well, um, let's dive into then uh, the, the conversation that I'm so excited about. And actually, I would love to start from your very beginning, which is your childhood. Where did you grow up? I love hearing the stories of amazing leaders that I know about how they became who they are as humans. So tell us, what do you remember about uh, growing up? And do you feel like there was already some interest in psychology when you were young? Um, so yeah, what, what was it like? Uh, I suppose for anybody listening, you can probably tell that I am from Ireland and sort of grew up in 19, 1980s, 1990s Ireland. And um, I think probably, you know, family, like for many people, that is that's a, such a formative part of your, you know, early experiences. So my, my mom was a 
a primary school teacher. My dad uh, was a philosopher at uh, the local university. And uh, uh, my brother, I like to fondly call him my lab experiment. <laughs> so we just, I, I do remember a lot of conversations probably just around the dinner table about, you know, human behavior. Why do people do what they do? You know, why do we do things even when they're not in our own interest? Um, all of that sort of thing. So it was probably there from an early stage. Um, I suppose also just it was such an interesting time to grow up in Ireland. So, you know, it, this is a country that's a small island, um, very strong sense of national identity, heritage, culture, all the rest. Going through, but, you know, had been a very conservative Catholic country um, in many ways and was going through a really interesting social change, um, you know, economic development, lots more immigration, lots more sort of generally just becoming more cosmopolitan society. Uh, so I was always was interested in, you know, how, what, what we call in psychology, social identity. So how, <clears throat> how you get your sense of identity, your sense of belonging from the groups that you, that you, you know, affiliate to. And what happens when that really changes, you know, that strong sense of identity you've always had, and suddenly you're in a very different sort of social context. Um, so that was that was always a real interest for me and probably more on that side than on I was never that drawn to clinical psychology actually I just I always thought there's so much that we can all learn from um, you know how especially within that kind of that social social psychology lens that's amazing and I love how you started talking about identity and that's something that also I'm super passionate about as a person who moved <laughs> around the world a little bit uh, and how do we perceive ourselves and how are the perceivers so we'll actually I'll have more questions about who we are and how people see us late in this conversation but, but I also wanted to talk about kind of the main topic which is leadership and kind of this series yep. are all about leadership and I feel like you are in a very fortunate position because you we're able to see it from two different angles. From on one hand, you've done all this research and you kind of read about psychology of leadership and you tell everyone about psychology of leadership. On the other hand, you are a leader yourself, so you have to actually uh, practice it and experience it. So how were these two matching? And what was your biggest surprise, I suppose, when you became a manager, though you already knew a lot about psychology of management? What did not match in that picture? Yeah, well, I'm definitely guilty of not always practicing what I preach, I think, for sure. Um, it's, you know, it's hard. It's harder than it than it looks in many ways. And um, probably I experienced something that I imagine a lot of people identify with is that, you know, when you're promoted into a leadership role, management role, feeling a sense of imposter syndrome. You know, I'm, who am I to, to manage this, this team of extraordinarily talented people? Um, and when I worked at my engine where we had this, you know, quite a big team of really the best and the brightest minds in, in business psychology, behavioral science, neuroscience, um, who were, you know, fresh out of university, had all the sort of latest thinking ideas at their, at their fingertips. And you think, oh my gosh, you know, my, the inner critic starts going. But, but actually what I've come to realize, uh, you know, over the years and with more experience, and this is very much in the, in sort of the research on leadership, is that your role as a leader is is actually um, not to be the smartest person in the room, you know, not not to be the person who solves all the problems, um, but actually to create the conditions for other people to thrive. Um, and I think that's a really important insight when you kind of get to it yourself. Of just my job here is to make it easier for other people to to flourish, and there are you know lots of different ways in which I can do that. But um, that's probably been a and learning along the way. That is very interesting. And uh, I totally agree with you. I feel like when you do things for a while yourself, so you're very hands-on and suddenly you are not hands-on anymore to have that switch mentally is probably one of the hardest things. And uh, as soon as you realize that, you can bring more value by not doing things than by doing things. I think magic does happen. And talking about different leadership skills, um, do you have, uh, I, I don't know, from all the research that you've read and all the experience that you have, is there any good uh, list framework and like what are the top skills that you would say the, the current leaders need to have to be amazing at uh, leading people and managing people? So I suppose one of the things that 
one of the traps I think that we fall into um, is in feeling is in feeling like we have to show up a certain way. So if we just talk about that bit for for a second, kind of the you know the impression, the presence that you have as as a leader, and um, what what we may not realise, and there's, there's some really interesting research on this, and it's sort of a well founded um, uh, sort of finding, is that when we meet people, when we perceive people, we effectively ask ourselves sort of two questions. So if you're meeting your new leader, you're thinking to yourself, can I trust this person? Are they trustworthy? Are they warm? Are they likable? Um, and that's one dimension at which you're kind of assessing people. Um, and we call that warmth. That's the sort of the name of the term. Uh, and the other is, are they competent? You know, are they, um, uh, do I think they can do the job? Do I think they have the skills actually to do the job? And I think a trap that a lot of leaders fall into is seeing these as two ends of the spectrum. And actually it's, it's a two by two. So it's not that you can't be, you know, if you think, if you conjure up the images and there's, there's a good sort of a comparison here with, with the Simpsons. So if you think about sort of the Simpsons, right? That this is the matrix and the, um, on that sort of warmth, cold spectrum. So cold, but highly competent. You've got Monty Burns, right? So he will, like you wouldn't trust him. <laughs> and, but you know, he's capable of doing really terrible things. Um, and the other, the opposite end, you've got somebody warm but highly incompetent, Homer Simpson, right? So that's the sort of, those are the two extremes. Um, and of course, the Holy Grail as a leader is to be in the upper quadrant, more like a Lisa Simpson type character, which is um, warm, likable, and actually very competent. So that's where, you know, that's where we're trying to, trying to get to. Um, this is so yeah. amazing. Can you just comment that I don't think anyone ever described that the kind of the ideal leader should look like Lisa Simpson. I think this is just, uh, um, I, I should, I should print out a post to like, be like Lisa Simpson. This be, is be more like Lisa. Exactly. Yeah. You could totally get a, a meme going. Um, yeah. So that's, that's sort of where you, you know, where you're striving mm -hmm. to be. Um, and there are different ways in, in which we can do that um, as a leader. So it's about, um, you know, first you, the, the really interesting bit in, in the research and this, this might be a bit counterintuitive for, for us is that actually you should lead with warmth so don't lead with your competence and your expertise that's where we all kind of we fall into that trap um, it's much better to lead with um, you know, making a connection having a human connection with people and then that's the foundation on which you demonstrate your, your competence um, so you know practical things are being interested in other people, you know, taking the time to be really interested in, in your team, asking them about their family, their well-being, just having that genuine interest, um, but also being authentic and, and a little bit vulnerable, like share what's on your mind, so that you don't have to be just perfect and on it all the time, but rather these are the things that I'm learning, that I'm working on, that I'm developing myself in um, as well. And then seek feedback. So, you know, be open to getting feedback, asking your team quite, making it safe for people to, to give you feedback. Um, so that, that's probably a, a, like a, a bigger overarching thought just about how we perceive, perceive people and particularly um, those in leadership roles. That, that's a great way to think about it. And I love how you talk about the warm says more or, or comes first before competence. And you're right, when we meet someone kind of for the first time, it's very difficult to assess their competence in, in mm -hmm. the first five, 10 minutes of the conversation, yeah. but we can definitely assess the warmth and the empathy and uh, how this person behaves towards everyone else um, around them. And uh, I would say that is definitely a massive factor of how we judge people and how we make first impressions. So it's, it's good to hear. And I suppose also in, in terms of leadership context, um, there has been too much focus on strength and competence and being all this uh, unbreakable person that can lead everyone to mm -hmm. um to win anything uh while actually uh, empathy and warmth uh, is uh, is half of it uh, yeah. which is really good to hear yeah i think i think you're absolutely right that you know there's there has been a a shift from the the heroic leader to the engaged leader so we don't need the leader who can you know do everything solve every problem but the engaged leader is one who, as we said, you know, creates those those conditions for people to thrive. Um, and that's about, you know, we've done some work on this recently at, at Stuart. Um, you know, so three big things there are 
clarity. So ha creating clarity for your team. Everybody knows the vision, the direction where we're going. And we're all, you know, crystal clear on that. And then alignment. So how are you aligning your team, um, your resources, the agendas to be sort of pulling in the, in the same direction? Um, and then vitality. And this is that sort of less tangible, but really important thing about just bringing energy and inspiring people, and, you know, putting a bit more energy into the system. Um, and I think a lot of leaders, it, you know, where, again, where we fall down is we, we're t we tend to focus on those sort of classical, like above the surface things, like I need to have the, you know, the strategy in place, I need to get the right team formed, and I need to figure out the structuring and whatnot. But actually those things that sort of sit below the surface, if you will, have more of an impact, more of an influence um, so you can have, let's say, for example, as a, as a creative leader, you've hired, you've, you've assembled your team, you think you've got, you've hired in all of the best people in the business, um, which is great. And you've, you've set a very clear agenda, but actually, if you're not looking below the surface, like how does it, what is the team dynamic? How cohesive is this team? Does this team trust each other? Is there a sort of psychological safety for people to, to share, to speak up, to challenge, um, and those things can be really derailing if, you, if they're not in place and if you're not sort of focused on them as well. That all sounds great, but I have to say in practice, it's hard. <laughs> it's hard. It's really hard. Yeah. And uh, I've read many books about psychology and leadership and they're all very, very good. And after you finish the book, you're like, oh, now I know everything. Now I know everything. I, I, I'll yeah. go tomorrow and it'll be so amazing. And then there is so much going on. I mean, being a leader is not just like being on stage and performing well. You actually need to make things happen and some things are stressful and all of this. Um, what's your personal experience with leadership? And I suppose, what are your biggest challenges? M knowing everything that you know, what things are the most difficult for you? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> certainly, certainly. I'm making it sound much easier than it actually is. You know, I think uh, I, I know the theory inside out on how to give feedback and give tough feedback and what you're supposed to do. And we can come and talk about that in a minute, but um, I will be the first to say that I still find it really hard. Um, I, know it's, I know it's really important um, and it can make such a difference, but I do find it, I just personally find it quite difficult. And, um, and that's, you know, we call this in psychology, the, the knowing doing gap, right? So we know these things, um, but then it's also interesting when that kind of mirror is held up and said, but do you do them? And, and why, what is the interesting bit is like in that gap, like why is it you don't do these things? Um, part of it for me on that particular point is, and probably others will identify with this, is um, it's partly me and it's partly organizational. So it's, it's tricky, right? If it's not something that's sort of within the, and most organizations struggle with this. It's not like a habit. It's, it might feel a bit awkward and it's sort of unusual to be giving feedback. Um, that's out of sort of particular review cycle or whatever it might be. Um, and that's something we're actually working on to make it much more of a kind of day-to-day -day normal habit, something that you ask for, that you, you know, you, you have a feedback conversation at the end of meetings, etc. cetera. Um, it's a journey. <laughs> um, and then part of it is me just, you know, I think I'm, I remember ironically once being given the feedback, um, you know, just you're a little bit too too nurturing um, with your team, and I at the time I really railed against it. I was like, that, you know, how can that be? And that you know, is that even a thing and whatnot? And and was quite dismissive in my mind of this feedback. But actually, it was you know, there's there's always like that kernel of truth. And I think it's about you know when you have a, a strength which might be sort of being quite, you know, kind and nurturing and whatnot with your team. But actually, when you overplay that strength it can be that you, you know, avoid things that actually are really important, like giving people feedback that they do need to hear. Um, so that's, the, I suppose that's a good bit of self-awareness on my part that that is, it doesn't come that naturally to me. It's, it's something I have to, I have to work out. Wow. Too nurturing. I mean, it is hard to, I, I never thought that if you have like a good characteristic that it, it could be too much of your mm. goodness. And I love that you highlight that, yeah, no matter what sets of characteristics and traits we have, you can always kind of disbalance you do too it. Too much of it. Yeah, yeah, too much of it. Yeah. Um, that's very interesting. Well, we started talking about feedback, so I want to dive deeper into this very, very interesting conversation because I also find it very hard to give feedback, receive feedback, um, even though I'm, I suppose I'm getting used to it. 
Um, but uh, I, I probably have a di different um, problem from yours. I'm very good at giving negative feedback. Maybe <laughs> that, that's my Russian side. <laughs> Uh, I, it's, it's actually not very difficult for me to tell people what, how things are. And I also expect that people will be as direct and straightforward with me with their feedback because that just speeds up the process. I don't need like all this feedback sandwiches. Uh, I can just get straight to the point. <laughs> uh, but unfortunately, it doesn't really work very well with everyone as well as I found that I struggle with positive feedback uh, in both ways, giving someone positive feedback as well as receiving positive feedback just completely throws me off. Like when someone gives me any piece of nice feedback, I literally don't know what to do with it because at least negative feedback is actionable while positive feedback, you like don't know what to do with it. So how can we give better feedback and how can we receive feedback better? What's your professional advice on that topic? Yeah. Yes. So, well, you're certainly not on your own uh, with, that, with that on both sides, I think. Um, so giving feedback, um, one simple model, which I can share here might be useful for people and, and possibly they will know it already. Um, I think this is the Center for Creative Leadership coined this, which is the situation behavior impact. Um, I, I would probably add on intent at the beginning. So Let's say you, you need to, you, you know, you've had a, had a meeting with a, a more junior designer in your team, you've been presenting some concepts, be it to a client or somebody internal or whatnot, um, and uh, they haven't, they just didn't present it very well, and it didn't seem very compelling, it wasn't very clear what the message was, you know this better than me, Katarina, but you, you get the idea, so you need to give that feedback. Um, it's, I think the first thing to say, is, so intent is about showing positive intent, so, you know, I, I know that that's the first time you're in that situation. This is, you know, all quite new to you and I completely appreciate it. It was quite daunting. We had some really senior people in the room. So it's sort of showing like I'm, I'm on your side here. I'm not just going straight in with, with feedback. Um, that's the intent. The situation then is just describing very simply the where and the when. So it's very clear, like what kind of about the boundaries of this conversation, which was a specific meeting yesterday. Um, and then what was the behavior? And this, this bit is important to say that it, it's the, you know, what you, what you observed, not hearsay, not somebody else's judgment. It's like, what did I observe? So I saw that you were, you know, you didn't show great conviction um, when talking to the concept. It was a little bit unclear. Um, and then the impact, the impact is, I think our clients left feeling like that we didn't really, you know, have a clear idea of this they didn't seem sold on the ideas they couldn't see the difference whatever it might be or the impact on me is I actually felt this this and this um so just it I like this model in particular because it's so simple you know just thinking of those things in your mind can help you to just structure them so that's a little bit on giving feedback I will take a note of that for myself for the next time I need to do it <laughs> um and then you asked about receiving feedback right? yeah yeah so I think and, and thanks for sharing the model because I feel like um, it, it, it is at the end of the day about how we phrase things. And, and I actually mm -hmm. hate this about British culture, by the way, because it's all about the words that we use rather than the, the end message, because the end message is in the words that we use. Um, while for me, it was always like, well, we need this to be fixed or we need that to be done. So it doesn't really matter um, Like as long as I transfer the information from my head to your head, then it should work. But turns out, nope, it doesn't work. And actually how you phrase something is sometimes even more important than what you were trying to say. So I love that you shared this structure that kind of helps to phrase feedback that it will become actionable, but also doesn't feel like you're coming from a wrong place. So that, that's really good to, 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 to remember. So yes, now let's talk about receiving feedback because, and especially, I mean, I don't, I, you can talk about both negative and positive, but I would love advice on how to receive positive feedback because for me, that's the hardest. Probably, probably for most people, it's the, it's the constructive negative. I think you're a bit of a, a feedback junkie. You're like, you're, you, want, you want it, like you're, you're really hungry for it, but some people it's just they, their stomach sinks at the thought of, oh my gosh, I'm going to have a feedback conversation. And I think what, what, you know, what, what we often see there, it's, it's, it stems from two basic needs that exist at the same time in us as, as human beings. Um, and there's a, there's a brilliant book on this, by the way, called Thanks for the Feedback. You should read this, Thanks for the Feedback. Um, I them. Which is, uh, it's, I think, Sheila Heen and, and Douglas Stone. They are um, 
professors at Harvard and they work in negotiation and um, how to take feedback, how to have courageous conversations, etc. And they talk about you know, these two basic needs. So on the one hand, we have this great need to learn and to grow. And that's how we, you know, that's how we develop in the world. We're constantly, if you think about all the feedback that's around us in so many different ways, uh, we are very predisposed for feedback. The other need, though, is that I want to be accepted as I am. You know, that, that a very kind of existential, I need to be accepted as who I am. And so there's a, there's a very obvious conflict, tension here. Um, and so what happens then is you are, our automatic reaction a lot of the time is to what we call wrong spot, right? So wrong spotting is when I am going to just pick apart everything that is wrong with that feedback that I've just been given. So much so that I'm not even going to hear the little bit of truth so I talked about an example earlier, and I was so ready to dismiss it. There's no way this is true. So we, we, we wrong spot. We pick it apart, and then we don't, even, we don't even take it on board. And we do that because we're triggered. So we're triggered by um, a few things. One could be uh, the veracity, so the truth. There is just no truth in that. Like they, there's, they may have said a few things which are inaccurate, so therefore I'm going to dismiss 100% of what they said. We might be triggered by the person. That person said, do not trust them. They will, you know, they have their own agenda. Um, and again, we're just very quick to then not take it on because of, of who it's come from. And, and the last one, which is a, in many ways, I think the most interesting, is we might be triggered by um, something to do with our identity. So this is where if the feedback is something that is quite, is about something quite core that we're quite sensitive about, we will react much more. So if you said to me, um, you are a bit disorganized uh, at home and you're a bit messy I'd be like yeah tell me something I don't know I mean that is and it, and it wouldn't it wouldn't bother me you know I'm not sensitive I probably should be but I'm not sensitive <laughs> um but if it's something you know core to my work what I do how I see myself I will be a lot more probably likely to, to trigger so that that's sort of things to think about I think in terms of the positive feedback that's sort of taking on the you know I think learning to just just sort of accept it like in the moment say, you know, thank you. That's, you know, I really appreciate you saying that. Not making it you know, anything you have to really react to, but actually just respond, take it on, um, see it as just nice recognition. Um, and I think almost in a way, just accepting it quite quickly, it, it makes it less, because I think you're probably feeling the slight awkwardness that might come out in that conversation. <laughs> you don't have to sort of assess it. You just say, that's what, you know, thank you for sharing that. Um, that that's great advice, and I, I actually read the research somewhere. Like the reason why we're so uh, talking about positive feedback, why we're so reactive, it depends on the type type of feedback we receive as well. That mm -hmm. if we receive a compliment that is, let's say, a nice jacket or something, it has nothing to do with our. Uh, it only deals with present, doesn't have anything to do with our identity. Uh, then or achievements is like that's great jacket great thank you but if it's something to do with uh let's say you would say oh your podcast is really great i would be like oh i mean it is great now but what if i right. mess it up in a year and then uh kind of putting all this pressure on uh complimenting someone's achievement when obviously you start thinking, what if I fail now your perception of me? Um, and uh, yeah, I've heard someone saying like, yeah, just, just uh, basically uh, appreciate the moment now. And if, if you mess it up in a year, you will deal with the consequences yeah. of messing up uh, in a year. But I have to say, like, I think, yeah, those, those pieces of feedback, and I think you mentioned that as well in kind of in the negative feedback, anything to do with our identity, mm -hmm. how we see ourselves and what's important to us, uh, I think it's very hard, both negative and positive. And uh, I think, yeah, also probably asking why does it bug us so much would be a good start. <laughs> <laughs> it's, no, I think you're right. It's more loaded. It's something that you've got, you know, a lot more personal investment in. Um, so you're more likely to, to reflect on it. But yeah. yes, my advice would be accept it and then... <laughs> Don't think about it too much more. Amazing. Uh, well, another interesting topic that I would love to to talk about today is uh, uh, the whole kind of last year madness that we all experienced. And um, a lot of that, uh, I mean, a lot of us went kind of inside our heads and trying to understand who we are and what we like and what we do. And some of us went into dark places. And, and I definitely didn't cope with the last few months very well in terms of everything kind of slowing down in a weird way. Um, and I think in, in preparation to, to this conversation, we talked about uh, the concept of languishing. 
So can you talk a bit more about that and kind of how does that help us cope with this weirdness that we're all experiencing? Yeah, yeah, very happy to. Um, so I read this article a couple of weeks ago and it was in the New York Times and it was written by a quite a well-known organizational psychologist called Adam Grant. He does a great podcast uh, series, by the way, just to rival yours. Not as good, but you know, it's up there. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love this podcast, by the way. So I would definitely recommend everyone who, yeah, sign, sign up you know Work already. Life. Yeah, exactly, Work Life. Um, and he put out this piece, um, and the headline was something like, um, there's a name for the blah that you've been feeling this year. Blah, or, and then he talks about meh as another, you know, <laughs> way to describe it. Um, and it's gotten, actually got a lot of sort of attention. Um, it's been doing the rounds, a lot of people are talking about it. So many will maybe have picked up on it already. And I think the reason is it's just struck this chord, you know, something that we've all probably experienced to some extent over this past year or have had friends describe these symptoms, which, which is basically, you know, a, a lack of feeling a little bit aimless, but joyless, you know, not having very many contrasts in our life. Um, slightly dulled motivation, lack of focus. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's no wonder, right? We've all been working from home. We're out of our normal routines. Everything is just kind of merged. Um, Zoom fatigue, all of the rest. And he very helpfully put a term on it, which has existed in psychology for a very long time, which is languishing. And languishing is, it, if you think of mental health, and that's, you know, it, well-being, it exists on this spectrum from depressed, right, so despondent, low mood, everything you, you know already, all the way through to, to flourishing at the other side. And flourishing is when we have achieved mastery, we are thriving, we're just, you know, really kind of in flow. Um, and then languishing is this, as he calls it, the, the sort of neglected middle child in the middle, which is the, the absence of well-being, right? So it's not, you know, it's not poor Poor mental health it's just absence of well-being so what can you do about it I suppose is, is the question uh, I think the first thing is just naming it I think that is really actually helpful and being able to talk to your teams about it like this you're not on your own and feelings I found that quite liberating I've definitely had moments and I've seen it in my teams as well just of, of that sort of sense of, of languishing um, so a few things to, to think about we you know finding finding ways to to experience that sense of flow again so flow for anybody who's not familiar with it is that um, the notion that we can be doing things experiences where we just get completely lost like complete absorption uh, you, you, you know I'm sure as designers you have these experiences quite often like where you're just so in it that you actually lose sense of time distractions everything and you just feel like you're really um, thriving and you get a lot of personal joy from that so finding what are those things that I can where can I tap into more of that um, and ways in which to do that may be, you know, very practical things like uh, give yourself the, the, you know, the, the joy of uninterrupted blocks of time. Like give yourself like the, if you're a morning person, that's when you work best. Think about how your brain works or a night owl. You know, I'm going to give myself uninterrupted focus to just work on something, finding you know, a, a small goal that, that approaches what you want in terms of something more meaningful. So something that you can achieve, like this, this idea of we, we get a lot of satisfaction from achieving progress in things that are meaningful, that, that matter to us. Um, and, and this was the last point there around is just, you know, anchor to your purpose. Like what is in those days where it is all a little bit gray, you know, what, why am I here? Why am I doing this work? What, what is it serving me? Um, and, and that will be different for everybody, you know, and just spending some time thinking about that. Um, I think goes a long way as well. That is such a great concept. And I can definitely feel like uh, how we all experienced it. And I'm so glad there is a term for it because I have to say, I was thinking it kind of feels like a depression, but it's not really a depression. A lot of people, I think, talked about burnout, but I also felt like it wasn't a burnout either because I, like burnout feels slightly different. This was just, meh feeling as you described it and it's it was very different but you're right just having even a term for it already makes it so much better just because you know okay 
it's not depression, it's not burnout, mm-hmm. it's this thing, and I better not drown into the, the low point of depression and burnout. Um, so how can I dig myself into this from this middle ground to the, the flourishing and the flow and these small interactions and small things that we can do definitely is, is a good way. And I, I felt uh, that myself that as soon as I found interesting things to do, it might not be even to do with work, but those interrupted pieces uh, of interesting hobbies, um, whether it's sports or anything else, then you suddenly feel much better on every sort of level. Um, and just finding more of these tiny bits that you kind of put together, I suppose they will build up at the end of the day. Exactly. Exactly. That's right. And, and you know, this whole purpose topic, it, it's, you know, it's, it's such a big um, focus at the moment um, and it's probably something you know I'm sure you, you're thinking about it you're probably hearing people coming into your team talking about it uh, but it's and it's something we've been doing quite a lot of of work on recently of how because probably hearing me people think well that's great but you know how do I how do I get a sense of purpose like how, where do I find my sense of purpose I don't know what that is but so the first thing to say is it you know having a sense a sense of purpose is in your interest, it will make you feel more energized. You, you will generally have a better day because you're clear on why I'm, why I'm doing this and how can I make more space for it. Um, but there, I think there are a few myths out there about, about this topic and maybe worth kind of debunking here. So, you know, the, the idea that you have to find, find your purpose and it's this like grand higher calling um, mm-hmm. is not actually the case. You know, I think it's to what you just said there, it's, it's absolutely spot on. It, it's finding... It's not about finding purpose, it's about building purpose. So taking meaning, extracting meaning from small things. And they can be quite mundane things, but things that exist in your day, it's, you know, trying to think about what is meaningful for me and what I'm doing here, um, rather than I have to have this like really lofty, that's probably the first myth. I think the second one is that, you know, it's this, this notion that it's a single thing and that you have to have, and, and probably some designers do have a very strong calling and sort of singular focus I can imagine it's quite a vocational career in many ways uh, but for many of us that's not the case so it, you know you can have a sense you can find purpose and a sense of meaning in so many different ways and for some people it's actually not about work work is a means to an end to enable me to get more sense of purpose from what I'm doing you know my side hustle whatever that might be my um, you know community work family, etc. Um, and that's absolutely fine. We can have multiple, multiple sources of meaning. Um, and the third one, again, which is hopefully just to make it feel a bit more like this is, this is quite attainable for all of us, is that it doesn't have to be this consistent thing through your lifetime. You know, you can have, you, if you think about your sense of purpose, at least if I think about what drove me at 20 um, versus now and everything, you know, family life, everything that has happened in between, we have different anchors over time different things that matter to us where we get that sense of purpose and meaning um and that's again absolutely fine it's just knowing what it is for you right now and how you can how you can tap into that this is such a great reflection because um i totally agree with this kind of whole idea of purpose is slightly misunderstood and misinterpreted and definitely i feel like there is so much pressure on like finding your purpose and having this mission and everything you should you do in your life should be on purpose your job your career everything should go towards this one purpose and I had so many especially younger people coming to me saying that uh, how do I find my purpose I don't know what my purpose is I, I don't know yet I'm like it's fine you don't like yeah. you, you don't discover it in one day it might change as well like do what you what you like um there was actually a, another great concept from Stephen Kotler, who wrote recently The Art of the Impossible, and he talked about passion, uh, curiosity, passion, purpose, which I quite liked as a concept. I don't know if it probably links to a lot of things that you know, but I like that he basically talks how any sort of thing starts from your curiosity. So if you like knitting or, I don't know, uh, talking to people, it could be any random thing that doesn't really mean anything. It, it, it literally is the, like, the most mundane or basic thing, but you're just very curious about it. You might not be even good at it. It doesn't matter. You're just curious about it. And kind of out of lots of these curiosities, and all of us have hundreds of these random curiosities, we find something that you're actually passionate about. So you kind of want to keep doing and that might become your side hustle or a hobby 
And then eventually it might also link to everything else that you believe in and what you see in the world and that becomes your purpose. But also it might not happen and it might stay at the curiosity stage yeah. and a lot of things that you try, you actually won't even get to the passion or purpose stage. And that's okay as well. And I felt like it was such a useful concept for me because I... I felt like I was very lucky with Future London Academy because that was a curiosity, then it became a passion and it became a purpose. And I'm like, I'm nailing it with this whole purpose thing. I know how to do it. And I, I'm so passionate about everything that we do. And now I feel like, oh, I want to discover something new. What else shall I do? And I realized that it's very difficult to find a new curiosity or passion. And um, I, I've put so much pressure on new things that I would try. I'm like, I'll try um, Mai Tai and this will become my new passion. And it's like, okay, I mean, it's, it's nice. I like it, but I can't say that this will be the thing I will pursue for the next 20 years. And it just, the disappointment in not finding the purpose became like a big, <laughs> big problem. So I love the idea of, uh, yeah, just having multiple purposes and uh, kind of uh, having one at work and one at home and changing it through our life. I feel like that's a very helpful concept to have in mind. I think you need to take the pressure off yourself. <laughs> <laughs> you, but, but, but your example is a great one. I think absolutely, you know, it's, it's, it's a lovely way of bringing to life that idea of, you know, find, find the things that you're curious about, explore them, see where they go. And it might, might not take you to that grander sort of purpose, but it's, um, yeah, it, you know, it's, it's always worth the, the adventure. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And uh, I, I'm, by the way, now I'm, I'm very structured. I'm now in process of discovering my new curiosities and passions. And um, um, I already created a spreadsheet of potential things that I'm, <laughs> I'm curious about that include um, anything from shoemaking to horse riding. Uh, so course. who knows, who knows, uh, there might be something new coming out soon. Uh, but <laughs> I, you're right. It's all about enjoying the process as well. So I kind of, I made a passion finding a passion if that makes sense uh so i f i realized that uh, well never stop learning is our uh, motto and uh, i definitely like the process of learning no matter what it is and maybe that that's enough of a passion and a purpose just never stop learning um which is a great one yeah and i think you know and you, you are a really good example of that it, if you think about sort of as a leader and a team how do how do i create that kind of learning curiosity culture in my in my team it's um i think there, there are the obvious things right you know you can reward the people who are doing their learning and development and really kind of engage learners and all of that but it's also about um creating that environment where it's it's safe to you know it's safe to challenge it's making it really clear that we can we can experiment and we can fail and that's okay I mean, fail fast ideally don't spend too long <laughs> in the process but um you know we used to have this in our team which was um we used to call it our penguin moment uh, talking about when I, i'm trying to remember the origin of this i think it's to do with how penguins learn from watching like you watch the penguin who fell off the cliff and you're like oh okay we won't do that i think <laughs> so it now, was so the thing it was about like them was fishing it? or something coming out of winter they need to send one before they can all jump into the water i forgot the full story but you you're right yes. there was something about the penguin jumping off of the cliff yeah. to find out something exactly so you got you've got the the fall guy um but we kind of turned that into our uh you know what is your penguin moment from the week like what is the uh and we had li literally had like a fluffy penguin teddy um as we would do our weekly huddle so what Aww. you know what is the moment that your penguin moment where actually you just really you know you tried something it didn't work and how can we learn from that and just making that so normal that's just the thing that we do in our week um, I think is one way to really create that kind of ongoing learning culture. Um, another is obviously, as we keep talking about, you know, making it safe, fine to seek feedback, making that like your habit. We ask for this, you know, two minutes at the end of every meeting. Um, what are you learning? If you share some of your uh, interesting things that you're exploring at the moment, but sharing that with your team, what am I reading? What am I working on? Um, uh, that's amazing. And I love that you kind of started talking about how do you kind of motivate and encourage people to have this uh this curious mind and uh, an open mind to to try new things and to fail um 
and I feel like this is definitely like the whole fail fast and, and learn from your failures uh, is, is a great way to, to, to not be afraid to, to try new things because when you try new things, majority of them <laughs> will fail. So you better be prepared for that and not, lo- not losing motivation in the process of it when you tried one another and another thing and they all failed. It's, it's, a, it's a skill of what you already mentioned of taking feedback on board and this is kind of feedback that you get from the audience and the environment and kind of progressing with that. Um, I'm also very curious, again, going back to you and your thoughts, like what mm. motivates you at the moment and kind of uh, all like, yeah, what, what, how do you get out? What, what takes, gets you out of bed, I suppose, in the morning? Yeah, so um, I, I think for from, from me in many ways, it is the same thing that has motivated me for probably quite some time. I think I mentioned it maybe at the beginning as well of just... Uh, I, I definitely still very much identify with being a psychologist, thinking about what are, I feel that like there are so many useful, interesting concepts and ideas in, in psychology that are not necessarily that accessible to, to, to everybody, if you haven't been sort of trained in the profession. Um, and I do love the idea of, you know, how do we, how do we extract those things? How do we package that, create, and, you know, and you and I have collaborated on stuff like this in the past, you know, to, to sort of engage people on um, you know, why I should care about about this, like why is this in why is this in my interest? What can I learn? How can I use this at home? How can I you know use uh, influencing skills, for example, on my partner, but you know at, at work or whatever? Um, and so I, that that sort of theme, that thread, is is still there for me. I think you know when I'm if I am having a day of maybe feeling slightly more languishing, like um, I will start to look at okay, what what is some really interesting thinking that we can you know, take out, run a session with our, some of our leaders, whatever it might be. Um, that's definitely there, but it's not, you know, I, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't say that it's, it's, uh, it's the easiest sort of working. I will definitely look forward to some kind of home life, work life separation and having, I think, you know, even just the motivation of getting up, going into the office, seeing people, the energy that you get from sort of those collisions in the, in the kitchen and talking to people and sparking new ideas. Uh, for me at least is actually so really motivating that's amazing and I love how you also reflect on what motivates you and I feel like uh, there is so much about the topic of motivation like what motivates humans and what what we should do and shouldn't do and and again and and at the end of the day you kind of have to self-reflect a lot to understand what are the small things that trigger you or get you out of bed or like as you said you want to see colleagues you want to see people and kind of uh, I suppose in, in, instead of having this big thing of like, I just, just want to go back to the office and things will be normal or whatever. It's like understanding what parts of that uh, experience actually motivate you. Is, is, is it hanging out with people? How can you uh, find more space for that? Is it uh, separating the actual spatial work uh, from, from home and things like that? It is so important. And I constantly think about it and, uh, uh, I always find, and actually motivation, same as purpose, I suppose it changes through life. Um, and uh, I, I love finding those small things. It's like, ah, huh, that's an interesting one that actually gives me this boost of energy and uh, uh, yeah, keeps me, makes me uh, more excited. Um, talking about leadership and motivation and everything else, I also wanted to talk about the hard things because Again, all of these things are amazing and uh, we all aspire to be these uh, great leaders. Um, and, uh, but there are also lots of hard things throughout our life we have to deal with. And one of them is, is decision making. And uh, I'm sure throughout your career, there were decisions that were very hard. Um, do you remember a particularly difficult decisions that you had to make? And what was your thinking process? How did you approach it? Um, and kind of how did it all turn out, I suppose? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, good question. Um, I think probably one of the hardest uh, decisions was actually choosing to leave uh, my last organization, Mind Gym, and and to to go in house. So I've been there for you know the best part of the decade, um, and I think many people will kind of recognize that that sort of sense of identity that you could get with certain organizations especially the ones where you feel like you've really grown up right you've kind of gone through the ranks and you've you've seen an organization go on a huge journey and you've been part of kind of building it um and it's very close to what their the, the mission was very close to what i'm you know what what drives me which is very aligned i think in that sense um 
and you know wonderful colleagues included um it's it was really difficult to, to sort of to decide to to leave um but um ultimately i felt it was the right decision for me um because you know, I think there's something about change being rejuvenating in its own right. You know, just it's good to good to try thing, new things, get new energy. Um, I personally wanted to experience going into industry. So having been client facing for my whole career, basically, and, you know, I was in consulting, change management consulting before that. Um, it's, I think there's, there are distinct pros and cons. So, you know, client facing, and again, people on this call will probably, will, will recognize this tension of, it's so exciting, it's varied, um, but it comes with, you know, quite high pressure at times. And also maybe you, you, where you feel like you might miss out, which is what you get when you go in-house, is that kind of longer term relationships and longer term, getting to see the impact of what you're doing at a longer, sort of longer term scale. Um, but making that transition was definitely, you know, I had to think long and hard about it. Um, it, was, it would have been easier to just stay in many ways. But I had to... What was the, I suppose, the trigger because I think with those decisions when you look back you like when you already made them they 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 seem logical you at least saw the outcome so you know uh, if it was a good decision or bad decision in the moment I suppose how did you feel and what was the sign for your how, how do you usually make those decisions what was the sign for you in that particular example that okay I should make this decision this is this is the right thing or and, and when did you feel it? Like, how long did you have to think about it to, to actually arrive to a conclusion? Yeah, yeah, good question. I, I think it's, it's about, you know, as you, as you get more senior in your career, um, in, in a funny old way, certain doors start to close to you. So you can actually become uh, very senior, very tenured, um, but then not, you know, being client-facing. But if you've never had the experience of being in-house, uh, it's quite difficult to then sort of later in life try and make that transition across mm. because you just don't, you don't have the credibility of having well you don't really know what it's like to you know make mm. this happen in an organization um so i think i was thinking ahead a little bit you know if this will be uh, I, I want to have experienced both um and, and i sort of felt like there was a door or a window there that would probably close within a certain amount of time um so that was you know, it was a good time to to make the to make the move and then it was you know an organization that aligned with my interest the, the product is again people leadership um that I, I probably couldn't have gone in-house at like a i don't know a manufacturing firm or you know something it, i had to to feel and again i'm thinking about people listening to this it, it being passionate about the product for probably many people is really important like so what is it that you're actually selling or putting out into the market and um uh, i love how you when you were explaining it you actually mentioned kind of three things which is one kind of alignment with your purpose of like what you feel passionate about uh the second one was timing and it's like that's the right time and the third i suppose the kind of the more the bigger picture of like the where you're going with this like your final well it's not final goal but i, I suppose your goal and kind of your strategy <laughs> <laughs> but in general, like knowing yeah. where you want to arrive. So as you said, if you want to work uh, as a consultant, if you want to kind of do anything else in your life, it's good to have these two, uh, like the time that now is the time and also kind of the purpose, the type of the company and the passions that you have. Um, so it's really good to, to hear kind of your very uh, aligned uh, way of, of thinking. Um, I have actually last question for you because I just realized we really out of time and I feel like we could okay. talk for another five hours about psychology and you could recommend me all the great books that I should read because I am I definitely need some recommendations but uh, I actually want to ask you last question which is uh, kind of looking back five years ago uh, so at that point you would still be in probably at my gym uh, and uh, if uh, if you could go back and give yourself a piece of advice that would save you either a lot of energy, a lot of money, a lot of stress, time, whatever that is, but your next five years would have been slightly easier. What advice would you give yourself? I think somebody gave me this advice probably in, in response to seeing me um, in action at some point, and it's stuck with me ever since, um, and I wish I'd sort of known it sooner. Very simply, you know, worry about today's problem today my mind and knowing myself tends to go go way ahead and um to spiral a little bit you know start thinking about well, what if this happens and what if that happens and you know getting a kind of kind of slightly whipped up into a bit of a, uh, a frenzy at times 
And it was just really good advice on sort of centering on, you know, just focus on what's in your control today. What is the thing you have to achieve? What's most urgent today? Um, and it, it has really helped me because I, I just sort of say that to myself and then it helps to just compartmentalize a little bit, put that other thing aside. That's not today's problem, actually. And, you, you know, having a little bit of awareness for how your brain works, like cognition is really good. That this, oh, yes, I will do that. So let's not do that. <laughs> let's just focus on this problem. Um, and of course, then you get that sense of actually I achieved that and, you know, I'm not sort of spinning. Oh, I love it. And I think it's so, I mean, I can definitely relate to the whole spiraling in your own head. That, that, that's, that's my thing. Uh, and I can, I, I, I feel like it's so relevant for the time we are now where I think all of us think about the future and the next two months and the next year and the next whatever, the next life, uh, while probably not very helpful and kind of thinking about the problems that we can focus on today and challenges we can solve today uh, and things we can do and achieve today is a really great way to st stay mindful and stay balanced and stay, stay sane at the end of the day and happy. <laughs> exactly. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, Sinead, uh, for joining me today. It was such, such a pleasure talking to you, as always. And I mean, we talk about so much. Um, when we talk about our executive program for design leaders, I love all the advice and kind of your thinking about what leaders uh, need to think about and how they should, uh, should work and uh, how they can be better. So thank you for sharing your wisdom and knowledge with, with us and with everyone who is listening. Um, any last words for, for the leaders out there? or for I would just, just, just to say thank you. This has been a, yeah, a privilege and really lovely talking with you today. And um, yeah, I look forward to the next podcast. Thank you. Thank, yes, uh, thank you. And yes, everyone, please do follow Future Learning Academy if you're not following us yet because we have more leadership series uh, coming up. So there will be a, an episode next week and more general conversation with amazing wise people like Sinead and uh, other wonderful leaders who are doing incredible things right now. Thank you again. And um, thanks everyone for joining. And until next time. Bye.